and a longtime affiliate of the Global Health Institute, the African Studies Program, and the Gender and Women's uh, Studies Department. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, I teach classes on a range of subjects related to comparative and international education with a particular focus in Sub-Saharan Africa and more specifically in Malawi. I'm an ethnographer of education and I've spent about 24 years off and on in Malawi doing research on children's and families and communities experiences of education, health, democracy, and social relations, uh, particularly in Malawi. I want to talk to you today about education in Africa. Why should we care about education in Africa? First, as with education systems everywhere around the world, education across the continent reflects and reproduces societies and governments or states' as goals for the next generation. This is particularly important on a continent where about 50% of people um, are of potential school age. Schooling is supposedly linked to increased personal and national development, uh, better health, greater productivity, a whole bunch of outcomes that we say that we care about as a globe. It's also central in the creation of national and international elite structures. Schooling is now one of the primary mechanisms by which people either gain or consolidate uh, positions of power nationally and internationally. It's very hard to move uh, across borders and get high paid jobs, for example, without educational certification at this point. Schooling is also receiving a huge percentage of many countries' budgets. So we should also care about it because the countries across the continent are saying, we're going to put a huge amount of resources into education. In fact, the continent has some of the highest rates of investment in education in the world. There's many countries that are spending upwards of 20% of their entire annual budget on schooling. And lastly, I think we need to care about it because countries like the US are pushing it. So we are spending a lot of time and energy telling countries across the continent that they should be expanding formal schooling. They should be making sure that a more and more equitable group of children are getting into school. And they should be spending more and more time and energy assuring the kids make it through school, having learned um, things that are considered important by the country and indeed internationally. So before we go further, let me note one thing. Schooling is also tied up in very complex ways with the state, as you just heard. States often invest a fair amount of money into schooling as a mechanism by which to reproduce citizenship. So. They send kids to school with the assumption that by the time they graduate, they are good citizens of the country. But schooling is often used as a marker or even a barrier to taking active part in uh, the state. For example, many countries uh, still require that elected officials at the national level speak English or speak the colonial language. And that almost always requires that children have gone through relatively high levels of schooling to accomplish. So again, there's this tight link between schooling, um, state power, and state governance uh, that often goes undiscussed, but that is very important to understanding why we should care about education. Before we go on, I want to talk about what I mean by education. There are many, many different forms of education uh, across the continent and around the world. For the most part, I'm not going to be talking about them here um, in this particular presentation. Here, when I talk about education, I'm really using it to mean formal schooling, and more importantly, formal Western-style education or schooling. That is what it is that we're doing right now. Formal Western-style education was imposed throughout Africa by first uh, missionary systems of various sorts, and then by colonial governments. It's only one of many, many types of education systems, including religious educational systems, initiation ceremonies and systems, apprenticeships, and so forth. So although education is actually this extraordinarily broad term that really means uh, socialization in its many, many different forms, 
for the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to be talking about the form of education that has been imposed and now selected across much of the world. So I want to start briefly by talking a little bit about the history of this formal schooling system. These formal Western schooling systems were originally provided by religious institutions, uh, uh, Christian religious institutions, across much, although certainly not all of the continent. Uh, there were other parts of the continent, for example, that already had very well-established uh, Muslim education systems. And these, uh, although many have now been incorporated into the formal school system, these uh, for, for centuries and millennia, in fact, operated on some very different um, educational uh, assumptions and models. These uh, missionary education systems generally served a very small percentage of the population, um, often estimated to be one to two percent, generally served, uh, at least initially, only male children, um, often only served children whose parents had converted to the particular church that was running the school in that area, and tended to serve children in areas that were favored by foreigners, particularly in geographical areas where um, Europeans didn't die quite as quickly from malaria, for example. So mountainous, uh, mountainous higher areas, for example. Over time, though, colonial governments picked up these missionary systems, which themselves were quite diverse. So to give you an example, in Malawi, the country that I'll be talking about quite a bit, uh, in Malawi, there were two education systems or school systems that were developed relatively early and relatively robustly. One in the northern region of the country was founded by the CCAP, which was the Scottish Presbyterian Church, and the other was founded in the south by the Dutch Reformed Church. And the Dutch Reformed Church, which was um, extremely powerful uh, across uh, south of the country, for example, in, in South Africa, the Dutch Reformed Church focused very strongly on training people um, to be manual laborers. They refused to uh, teach Africans how to read, for example, because that was viewed as a very dangerous uh, behavior. Their system mirrored in a lot of ways um, systems in the US and across um, areas where enslavement was practiced, where uh, any education that was offered to the enslaved population aimed to basically silence them. In contrast, the Presbyterian Church was working out of uh, a long-standing system of viewing education as liberatory, um, particularly as liberatory in their battle against the British. So the Presbyterians focused very strongly on teaching uh, literacy skills so that people could read the Bible for themselves. They also focused on training um, African pastors. And in fact, uh, the first uh, effort at revolution in Malawi was led by an African Presbyterian uh, pastor, John Chilembe. All of these very different missionary systems were picked up and consolidated and centralized in various ways by colonial governments um, over the late 1800s, but particularly into the early 1900s. And as the colonial governments pick these education systems up, they come to reflect the education approaches of uh, the imperial country more directly. So for example, British colonies, uh, their education systems come to more directly reflect policies and practices and debates occurring in the British education system of the time. As the education systems are picked up by the colonial uh, governments uh, more directly, expansion of the education systems therefore also starts to mirror uh, expansions, debates, discussions about expansion that are occurring um, in the imperial um, center. And so, for example, across um, the British colonies, there is an expansion geographically to try to cover uh, more area um, in order to try to basically educate a cadre of, of youth who can then become um, uh, quote-unquote uh, local leaders uh, that are influenced, heavily influenced by uh, the British uh, colonial government. And there's also expansion to new groups like girls who are a target of expansion um, in the UK, in the um, British areas itself. At the moment of independence across the continent, 
many independence movements are, are run uh, by people who themselves took part in these colonial education systems. Many of them originally went to school um, in the colony in which they were born, uh, but then eventually uh, left and went to school either in metropoles on the continent, such as South Africa or Kenya or Uganda, or uh, they went to, more often, went to Europe uh, or the U.S. to continue their higher education and then returned to run independence movements. Many of these educational elites called for Education for All, or EFA, as part of their call for independence. They promised, in other words, that they would expand Education for All once the country gained independence. And the reason that they planned to expand education, the reason that this promise of education for all was so powerful, was that at the time of independence, uh, local elites had become largely, not entirely, but had become largely educated elites. And therefore, the promise of expanding education to everyone was a promise of expanding elite status and everything that it brought with it to a broader swath of the population. Over time, however, there were very different trends that developed in post-independence countries. In socialist countries, for example, I'll speak to this in just a second in greater detail, but in socialist countries, there was generally a wide expansion um, of education. So example, for so an education for all approach was basically adopted. In Western aligned countries, in contrast, there was not very much expansion uh, of the education system early on. In fact, there was often consolidation of education only at the higher levels for those who were already able to make it through. And then there were countries that uh, went into um, an unstable or violent state. And in these countries, um, the education systems seldom expanded. And in fact, in some cases, what already existed uh, was, was destroyed. In the 1960s and 70s, most Western-aligned countries adopted a focus on human capacity development that was aimed at investing in a limited number of people who would help the government uh, attain nationalist goals. So in other words, uh, higher education and secondary education in particular were expanded in order to create a cotter of national uh, doctors, lawyers, engineers, policymakers, and so forth, who would be able to drive the new nation um, into the future. Uh, international investment in these efforts was generally relatively limited, with the government really taking uh, the lead role, and in most cases, uh, creating new secondary schools and or national universities. Higher education and secondary education were often free or were of very low cost, while children had to pay very high or relatively high primary school fees. What this meant is that you really kept a, a steep triangle in place. There was limited access to secondary and higher education, and the only people who could access it had the money to pay for primary school fees in the first place. In contrast, in the socialist-aligned countries, there was a strong focus on expanding education for all, as I mentioned earlier. And in these efforts, there was both government and international investment, international investment particularly from, um, for example, Soviet-aligned countries. And education was not framed as human capacity or human capital development, but instead as a basic need uh, for all children and for the socialist development uh, of the nation and the world. In the 1980s, however, uh, many countries across the continent, most countries across the continent, felt uh, the impact of the international financial crisis. And many governments had to turn to international development regimes for survival. This was the era of structural adjustment programs, the first of which was adopted in Malawi in 1981, uh, funding, funding coming from the World Bank. And uh, structural adjustment programs uh, required a great many things of these governments, things like uh, floating the currency, privatizing um, public companies, um, radically transforming um, trade relations, lowering trade barriers, and so forth. But they also required that the governments disinvest in social services. 
there were usually caps placed on the percentage of GDP that could be spent on education or health or agricultural extension and so forth. And there were caps placed on the size of the civil service and the salaries that could be paid to civil servants. This obviously uh, has tremendous implications for education in at least two ways. First of all, the largest cadre of civil servants in every country around the world are teachers. And so when you cap the civil service, you're capping the number of teachers that you can hire. And the second is that education was, uh, throughout the colonial and the initial independence era, viewed as the way through which you gained access to white collar jobs. But almost all white collar jobs across most of the continent were generated through the civil service. And so when you capped this number of civil servants that could be hired, you kept the number of, of school graduates who could get jobs. And this radically changed the meaning of education over the coming decades, um, particularly in social mobility. And lastly, during this period, because of the financial crisis, for those countries that were more aligned with the Soviet bloc, the socialist aid also pulled back and began to disappear, leaving countries really struggling to fund uh, the education systems they had, much less expanding them. However, towards the end of the 1980s, uh, a number of economists in the World Bank, particularly George Sakharopoulos, began to develop arguments for education as a high yield investment. In, in particular, they argue that there is no better investment for uh, a state, at least a low income state, than primary education, and particularly primary education for girls, because the correlations between higher educational level and better health outcomes, greater agricultural productivity, and so forth were so high. And as these arguments develop alongside the more socialist arguments related to education as a basic right and as a basic need, we see a convergence on the international stage in the argument for the importance of basic or primary education, which is anywhere between the first six and eight years of schooling, depending on the country. And so in 1990, uh, the World Conference on Education for All is held. And at this uh, conference, which results in the Declaration on Education for All, most governments in the world, with the usual exception of the US and uh, Somalia, pledge to provide education for all to their children, and also for the wealthier countries, pledge to provide money uh, to poorer countries who adopt education for all policies and practices. Very quickly after this broad declaration, which initially says, you know, education for all, adults, children, anyone, very quickly after uh, this, these pledges are actually, are actually made, there's a narrowing to a focus on formal primary education, especially for girls. And this narrowing occurs at least in part because the World Bank becomes the biggest funder for education. And this, from their perspective, is the education that is worth investing in. Following the 1990 declaration, many, many countries across the continent declare universal free primary education. Um, and move generally to imposing increasingly high fees to attend secondary and higher education. So in other words, we see a flip on its head of the um, previous model in Western aligned countries where investment was made primarily in higher education to investment being made primarily um, in primary education. For many countries, this was a huge leap of faith. They knew that internally they didn't have the money to support an education for all approach. And that was one of the reasons among many that they had never actually adopted such an approach. But the international development community had promised that this money would become available if countries took the leap of faith and adopted education for all policies. In many of the countries though, who, who made these uh, promises, the international funding never fully materialized. And so many governments ended up having to spend huge amounts of money to provide what in many cases was very low quality education to an extremely large number of, a, a very large number of new children uh, into existing systems. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. Let's go back for a second though to why we see this convergence on a focus on primary education, especially for girls. Again, many of the arguments that are made during this time with the exception of the arguments that education is simply a basic right and everyone should have access to it. The arguments made particularly by organizations like the World Bank uh, 
focused on correlations that existed at the time. So having higher levels of schooling led to, was correlated, sorry, did not lead to, was correlated with a whole range of outcomes that were viewed as extremely positive by the international development community, by governments, and by communities themselves for the most part. However, what's very important to remember is that these were correlations, not causal arguments, uh, or at least not causal evidence. And what this means is that while it was initially true that all of these different things were associated with higher levels of education, over time we actually see some of these correlations fade, and I'll talk about that a little bit later as well. So as this Education for All movement takes off following the 1990 Declaration, there comes to be a growing consensus around the world that education is uh, really an essential investment for governments, that is, it's an essential public investment in the development, basically, of human capital. That when governments invest in their people, their people become more productive and more healthy and therefore lead to the development of the country in this virtuous cycle. And this comes to be so common sense that by the late 1990s and early 2000s, uh, the notion that not everyone should uh, be educated is for the most part simply doesn't exist anymore uh, in, in much of the world. And we see this kind of very broad international consensus about the importance of educating everyone in the Millennium Development Goals, which are um, adopted in 2000 and which include uh, Millennium Development Goal 2, achieving universal primary education, and Millennium Development Goal 3, promoting gender equality and empowering women one of the primary mechanisms uh, for promoting equality and empowerment was uh, viewed as education. And so this, this uh, third millennium development goal also um, fed into a focus on uh, basic education, but particularly girls' basic education around the world. So although in the 1990s, the international development community really doesn't step up and uh, provide the funding that it had initially promised for education for all. By the 2000s, you do start to see an increased flow of funding, uh, particularly for primary education um, into uh, many countries across the continent. Not only do you see international funding increase, but as I noted before, national funding for the most part was extremely high. In fact, some would say uh, too high in some countries um, in an effort to, to support these efforts. And very importantly, families and communities were spending huge amounts of resources to send their children to school, both boys and girls. So before Education for All was actually declared, there were a lot of arguments made about families not being interested in educating all their children, particularly their girl children. People were saying, even if you provide Education for All, people won't send their kids. And that was quickly proven absolutely incorrect, including sending girls to school. However, one thing that's very important to note here is that the progress made in Education for All was made almost entirely in the very early grades, first grade, second grade, third grade, and fourth grade in particular around the world, before puberty. Once puberty hits, there remain significant issues in keeping girls in school, but at least early on, it turned out that parents wanted their little kids in school, and as soon as they were given the chance to send them there for free, they did it. So what were the results of the adoption of Education for All? There were sharp enrollment increases of about 40% across the continent, and as I mentioned earlier, really significant increases in family, government, and international investment in education. The Millennium Development Goal number two was also the development goal around which the greatest progress occurred um, across the entire uh, globe during this time. Nonetheless, 54% of the world's out of primary school children continued to be in Sub-Saharan Africa, and only one third of countries in Africa achieved universal primary education by 2015. And the world remains off track for achieving universal primary education by 2030. International funding, perhaps most importantly, plateaued after the 2008 global financial downturn and continues to remain well under uh, what was promised by the international development community. This is really important because everyone knew that education for all efforts were not going to be feasible 
if they were only funded uh, by governments in Africa. While some countries could easily bear this burden, many countries could not. And the international development community promised funding to support countries that adopted education for all policies because of a recognition that the world needed to invest in every child's right uh, to an education. So when, when the international development community fails to fulfill its funding promises for education for all, and by the way, they certainly don't only fail to fulfill their funding promises for education for all, the same thing has happened around many other, for example, health initiatives, agricultural initiatives, climate change initiatives, and so forth. So it's not that education is unique in this regard, uh, but what happens is when you when you adopt a policy like Education for All, which is very, very, very difficult to roll back, it's very difficult to tell people, we gave you free education and now we're not giving you free education. Now you have to pay for this. Um, in fact, Liberia is uh, the only country that, I have that has done this. Um, and they reintroduced uh, Education for All recently. Um, it it puts governments in a really significant bind. And remember what I said earlier, we're not talking about, you know, 10% of the national budget being bound up. We're talking about 20, 25% of the budget just to provide what is honestly often not a very high quality um, education because there aren't the resources available to really do everything that governments want to do. Despite all of the issues that existed uh, with the Millennium Development Goals and international development efforts to support education for all around the world, the UN Sustainable Development Goals uh, once again uh, claim that there will be a focus on um, education for all and a focus on gender equity, which includes a focus on um, education. Uh, again, there's no indication that the resources needed to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals will be uh, found, but it's important to note that there does remain this notion now around the world that education for all is uh, appropriate and necessary, in fact, um, to achieve development. So at the national and international level, I, I want to stop here and say there's a radical change uh, over time across Sub-Saharan Africa, a radical expansion of access to formal Western primary schooling for children in many countries. And this radical increase in access is for the most part driven by communities and governments putting tremendous amounts of resources into educating their children and not receiving the support that was promised by the international community um, to assure that these efforts um, are as high quality as, as possible. Furthermore, it's really important to note that historically, one of the reasons that people cared so much about receiving an education was because it offered the opportunity for white collar jobs across the continent. However, in large part because of structural adjustment programs, which were um, adopted under extensive pressure uh, by the World Bank and other international development organizations, many countries saw this radical increase in the number of uh, school graduates at the exact same moment when their ability to generate new jobs was frozen by the international development community. So there's a lot of ways in which governments are really put in binds by the ways that formal Western style schooling has expanded across the continent. On the other hand, it's also clear that many children and many adults in the countries that also had adult education, uh, education for all efforts, that many children and many adults have benefited hugely uh, from access to basic literacy and basic numeracy skills, um, to school settings that provide safety, often provide access to food and to uh, health interventions as well as educational in interventions, to spaces where um, children have access to adults who care about them and who are focused on teaching them um, about where they live, uh, both locally and nationally and so forth. And so on the one hand, at a kind of national and international level, Education for all is, is 
is a complex phenomenon to examine. On the other hand, we know that for many individual uh, children, receiving an education has been transformative in very positive ways. And there's some evidence that at least in some cases, this is more true uh, for girls and for children in, for example, rural areas or from minoritized linguistic or ethnic areas or so forth than it is um, uh, for, for other kids. So this is a complex picture. It's not easily something that has gone well. It's not easily something that has gone poorly. It's something that is very complex and it's complex not only on a continental scale and on a national scale, but often at the community and individual scale as well. So now I want to turn a little bit to talk about education for all in practice in Malawi. Malawi is considered one of the world's education for all success stories. Um, EFA was introduced in 1994 uh, by the newly elected multi-party uh, uh, government. And within six months of it being introduced, enrollment more than doubled. There was a particularly high increase in uh, girls' enrollment. So from, from the perspective of simply getting kids into school, EFA was a phenomenal success in Malawi. But it came at a tremendous price, especially because the international development community provided many fewer resources than had initially been uh, promised. There were really significant cuts to other social services, uh, particularly agricultural extension and veterinary extension uh, for people in rural communities. And given, uh, given the fact that in Malawi, about 88% of the population depends on rain-fed agriculture, not having access to those extension services is a really, really big deal. Uh, but those cuts had to be made because the government is spending 24% of its annual budget on education. Most of that budget goes to primary education. There was also, by really any way you measure it, a significant decline in educational quality when EFA was introduced. And this was largely because the resources did not double when the school population did. Um, and moreover, the infrastructure didn't double and the number of trained teachers didn't double in six months. And so particularly in the first few years after Education for All was introduced, there was no way for the system to put up with um, the expansion that occurred. And the expansion continues to be quite large because fertility rates in Malawi are pretty high and therefore population increase is, is pretty high. And as I noted earlier, um, as kids started to graduate, you know, eight years down the road from the introduction of free primary education, there were many more primary school graduates, but formal labor opportunities shrank. And because the international development community was focused so strongly on primary schooling, they provided almost no resources to expand secondary schooling. But that would be, of course, the other path that would be obvious uh, for these kids. And so they finished primary school and it wasn't clear what it had led to. And that uh, caused its own time for individuals and for communities and of course for the, for the government. So to give you a little bit of a sense of what free primary education actually looked like, I wanted to show you some pictures um, that I took in 2000. So this is six years after Education for All has been introduced. This is a grade three classroom in the central region of the country. And this is a very um, average uh, grade three classroom. You'll see that there is a floor that's kind of a dirt floor. Um, there's a chalkboard that's in very poor condition in the front. The walls are in relatively bad condition and the lighting is not very good. There aren't a lot of teaching and learning materials around. And there's a very large number of kids uh, uh, for this one teacher. But you'll also note uh, that the kids are holding, this is a little bit hard to see, but right in the middle you see a kind of a thing that looks like a bow with little sticks coming off of it. That's actually a homemade abacus. And it speaks to one of the uh, great innovations that occurred in this, um, in this time, which was called Talular in Malawi, teaching and learning using locally available resources. And Talular was a program designed to teach teachers how to make their own teaching and learning materials at low or no cost uh, from the materials right around them in the school community. And, you know, they may not look quite as pretty as um, store-bought abacuses, but they worked really well and they could be made at low or no cost by kids and by teachers 
Um, and they also taught kids about the materials around them and how they could be used. So there were great moments of innovation, uh, but often in classrooms and in settings that were not very conducive uh, to learning. Many, many children and their teachers uh, learned under trees. This was a very, very common uh, view of uh, post-free primary education, particularly in the southern region um, where expansion happened faster than in the other areas because there had been lower enrollments earlier. This is a very uh, common grade six classroom in the southern region after free primary education. And again, you'll see a teacher, a relatively um, small chalkboard, although it's in better condition than the other, and many more students than you would usually expect to be with, with, with one teacher. And this is very common. This looks a little bit uh, kind of lovely, um, but what's hard to see in this picture is that the sun is phenomenally hot part of the year, and then it's pouring rain uh, at other parts of the year. There are um, insects that gather in the trees and that fall down on, on children or that um, move over children as they go towards the trees, the same with birds. Um, and it's a very difficult uh, place to, to learn, um, not only because of the, that physical environment right there, but also because spaces out in the open like this are almost always spaces uh, that receive traffic, whether it's foot traffic from community members, or in this case, there's a road running right along the side um, of the classroom. And so whenever trucks or bicycles or motorcycles pass by, all of the kids would look over and uh, try to figure out who it was and what they were doing. So it's a very difficult, difficult environment in which, uh, in which to learn. Now, there were some areas, particularly in the northern regions, that had better infrastructure for school and that faced um, fewer problems in this initial expansion um, because there were uh, classrooms for kids to sit in and uh, there were chalkboards in better condition and there were better there were more and better trained teachers um, in the region. And this points to the long legs of the colonial era that appear in particular ways in the education for all um, era. The northern region is where David Livingston uh, first stopped and it's where uh, missionaries first established schools in Malawi. And here we are, you know, more than 120 years later, and uh, these areas still have a slightly better um, uh, education infrastructure and tradition um, than the other countries. And therefore, EFA hits them differently than, than the, other, in the other regions. Um, I wanted to end with one more, one more uh, photo, which shows you another kind of innovation that occurred uh, very often um, during, during this period. Um, here you see a primary school in the southern region. Um, this is the area where we saw the kids learning under the trees. And you'll see that the community had collected uh, materials to create this shelter in the middle that kids could learn under that was shaded and that um, uh, kept away both rain and sun. Um, and they're also building um, new classrooms uh, behind. You can see the, the, the piles of, of dirt and of bricks that are being, that are being used. Uh, many communities came together with some governmental support and some international support in some cases, but communities came together and innovated in all sorts of ways to try to assure that their children received uh, the best education that they could in a system in which resources were not being uh, made available centrally as, as much as was needed. So I wanted to just stop and recognize um, the incredible work that communities did um, to try to improve their children's education through, throughout, this, throughout this period. Um, and that had results um, in, in areas where communities were uh, really investing and supportive of their children's education. You see over time schools develop into, um, into areas where children have greater success um, and greater learning outcomes. But because the system was always so financially strained, it's really important to recognize that schools were not able to play some of the roles that um, everyone would have benefited from them playing. And the only way they could have played that, you know, communities were doing everything they could. The government was giving 24% of the annual budget for schools. It was the international community that did not meet its own promises and that really failed to support children's learning across the continent. So what happened in Malawi because of, of free primary education or education for all? In many senses of the word, even though Education for All is viewed as a, a major success story in Malawi, uh, 
in many ways it fails. It fails as it was measured uh, by international and national actors against learning goals and against expectations for, uh, for example, how many years of schooling children would achieve and so forth. It also failed uh, by the measures of many communities and many individuals themselves because it didn't lead to jobs. It didn't lead to secondary school. People couldn't figure out always what the heck they had uh, sacrificed so much for um, when it wasn't clear how their children um, benefited from, from these new educational experiences. And as free primary education expands across Malawi, we also see a new failure developing, and that's the failure of the correlations between increased education and increased um, outcomes, development outcomes, so productivity, uh, better health outcomes, and so forth, uh, lower fertility rates, that was another very common one. We see those correlations starting to fail um, as well. But free primary education does do some things that are really important for us to consider from the perspective of understanding um, education on the continent. Because the introduction of education for all creates new forms of state dependence on international funders because the uh, government really simply cannot afford all of the costs of maintaining this education for all uh, policy. And free primary education also has really interesting and complex consequences on relations of power and authority among community and state and global actors. And anyone who's interested in that in particular, let me know and I can send you some, um, some great uh, sources on that. So now that I've talked to you about uh, the radical changes that have occurred in education across the continent, um, particularly since the 1990s, and I've told you a little bit about how Education for All plays out in one particular country, I want to talk a little bit about what I include, what I conclude more generally about education in Africa. First and foremost, I want to be really clear that this is not an argument against schooling for all or against the power of schooling generally to transform individual lives, uh, communities, and uh, states. But it is an argument against the status quo against continuing to have a system in which education for all is uh, assumed to be the desired outcome for all states, but international actors refuse to uh, provide the funding that they promised to support states in this effort. I also think it's really important that we step back and rethink the purposes and outcomes of schooling in a manner that hasn't been done previously. Because whether you're looking in the colonial era, in the independence era, or in the EFA era, models of schooling and ways that people have thought about what the purposes and desired outcomes of schooling are have always been very tightly centralized. So we need to step back and ask, what do different people care about? Why do people want school? What, what's, what's the goal? And then what is truly needed for schools to achieve these goals? And at least some of what is truly needed is going to be financial resources. That's only a piece of it, but it is going to be a piece of it. And then we need to think about how schools will play a positive role in helping students and communities survive and thrive. Schooling will not be important if all it does is provide certain skills that are only good for getting to the next level of education. We as a species and the continent face tremendous upcoming pressures from, for example, climate change to zoonotic diseases as we are experiencing in the COVID-19 era. How are schools going to play roles in supporting survival and thriving? That I think is the fundamental question that we need to ask ourselves. I believe that education is a right for every single person. I also believe it's a need. However, we don't have a good model for what that education should look like and how it is that we can assure that that education benefits people, both in the immediate and in the longer terms. 
benefits them individually, benefits them communally, and benefits the world. So what's next? Uh, some of the trends that we're seeing in education across the continent include a new focus on 21st century skills, quote unquote, a continuing focus on girls' education, although this is changing um, in important ways, um, some focus on lifelong learning uh, as opposed to just looking at the early grades, as has been the case for, for a number of decades now, and an increasing focus on education for sustainability. Um, this particular focus goes along with the broader Sustainable Development Goals framework um, that uh, was adopted in the UN. Unofficially, uh, I think uh, there's a number of really interesting trends uh, that we should be focusing on, one of which is the increasing disconnect between schooling and formal labor, which I've spoken about off and on throughout this talk, and another of which is how forms of religious schooling are changing uh, very rapidly, and this is true for both uh, kind of um, Christian denominations and Muslim denominations. And it's an area in which I think a great deal more research is needed to understand how people are making sense of what kinds of educational opportunities matter to whom and what the outcomes um, will be for society. So thank you very much for listening. And uh, I welcome any questions that you might have. Please feel free to uh, email me or get in touch otherwise. And I hope you are having a wonderful time in African Studies 277. Thanks. Bye.